Right, uh, it's seven o'clock and we can kick off. Um, welcome everybody. My name is Patrick Allen and I'm the chair of the Progressive Economy Forum and I welcome you to this, our third public lecture uh, on macroeconomics. The first two were delivered in the autumn by Robert Skidelsky and Will Hutton and you can find them on our website. Uh, I'm delighted to see such a full house for a, a midweek, damp, cold uh, evening, electronic economics, I think that's pretty good. Uh, so I think this is a tribute to our speakers, Stephanie Griffiths-Jones, John McDonnell, Rosh Ryan Collins and John Weeks, uh, and the subject matter of our lecture, which is the National Investment Bank. Now, uh, our speakers are itching to uh, get started, and time is limited, so I'll be brief. But first, I'm delighted to say that the lecture is co-hosted with University College London Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose, with Josh Ryan Collins, who's head of research there. And I'll introduce Josh in the Institute a little later. Uh, next, GDP alert. Uh, we are filming the evening and taking photographs. So if you don't want to appear, then please uh, contact us, send us an email uh, after the lecture. Uh, so a few words about uh, PEF. And apologies for those who may have heard some of this before. So uh, the forum was launched uh, in Westminster last uh, May. Why? Because of the disastrous policy of austerity and the measures taken by the government allegedly to deal with the aftermath of the 2008 crash. A and because there appears to be deep-seated misunderstanding at all levels about uh, issues such as debt and deficit and balancing budgets and how the economy works. And this has to be corrected if alternative policies are to be understood. We say that the economic programme of austerity is utterly misguided and misconceived, and the damage that it's caused to our country and its people has been completely unnecessary. We refute the idea that austerity was a tough but necessary choice to pay down unaffordable debt and a sky-high deficit. Austerity has been tried many times before, famously in the 1930s. It has always failed and caused great suffering. We utterly refute the nonsense still being peddled that Labour caused the 2008 crash and that increased debt and deficit in 2009 was due to profligate public spending. And it's worth repeating that the 2008 crash was a global financial event caused by deregulated banks. Uh, we have a pamphlet at the back of the room where we cover this in some detail. Uh, the deficit was an automatic stabiliser which followed the 7% downturn in GDP after the crash and prevented it from getting worse. So uh, the job of PEF is to devise a better economic program for the country and to help people come to a better understanding of the economic principles which will create pr prosperity and stability. And to this end, we have recruited a council of eminent economists and academics who meet monthly. Stephanie is one of our council. Uh, we take inspiration from the teachings of John Maynard Keynes, the most famous economist of all time. His ideas were put into practice in the 25-year period from 1950, the golden age of economics, when economic growth achieved a level not seen before or since. We reach out to progressive parties who may form the next government, and we work with them on macro policy, which may form part of the next government program. And to correct economic misunderstandings, we are devising print, uh, training programs, blogs, talks, and lectures, and glossaries on the principles of macroeconomics. So our plan? to defeat the theory and practice of austerity, show its nonsense, demonstrate the practical evidence-based ideas supported by leading economists, which will take its place. We are not politically aligned, uh, we are independent of any party, and we're not a charity, so we don't have to be even-handed. Um, <laughs> in 2010, the economy is growing strongly as a result of fiscal stimulus put in place by Brown and Darling. In 2010, the coalition government cancelled the program and embarked on their economic experiment. They peddled the idea of expansionary austerity. Clearly, the main aim was to shrink the state. The economist explained revealingly that the notion of expansionary austerity was the cover. So long as government shrinks as a result of the policy, the expansionary part <coughs> is secondary. Austerity policy is economically illiterate. Paul Krugman, Nobel Prize winner, wrote of austerity, its predictions have proved utterly wrong. Its founding academic documents have, have not just lost their canonized status, they have become the objects of much ridicule. If you cut spending when the economy is in recession, as the government accounts for 42% of the economy, it will cut demand 
and government receipts. So debt will go up and not down. Simon Wren Lewis, our, one of our council members, describes cutting government spending when monetary policy could not offset its income as the most damaging macroeconomic mistake in my lifetime. Did it work? No, it did not. Debt was 36% pre-crash, 62% when Osborne took over, and 84% now. So the deficit is under control, but at what cost if the patient is nearly dead? Simon Wren Lewis estimates the cost of lost income due to austerity at £10,000 per household. You'll be familiar with the litany of damage caused by eight years of austerity. The UN report by Philip Alston, published in November 2018, has a shocking and comprehensive breakdown of harm. No part of the public realm has escaped. But the key economic results are these. The growth in the economy in 2010 was snuffed out. Recovery to pre-crisis levels of GDP was the slowest in 314 years. Real wages are still lower than they were 10 years ago. Productivity has flatlined since the recession and stands at 19% below trend. There is much employment, but much of the wrong kind, insecure, zero-hours contracts, self-employed with insufficient employment. Austerity has been a terrible mistake. And what can we do about it? Well, we are working on macroeconomic policies to put the country back to austerity, including green and innovative policies. Larry Elliott writes this week in The Guardian that local buses to speed rush hour journey times in Birmingham will provide better value to the Birmingham economy than HS2, which will save 16 minutes on a journey to London. And the benefits of the cycling economy, for example, are immense and the cost is minimal. So it's tragic that HS2 are backtracking on a cycle route along the path of the railway, which means that some children will be unable to cycle to school because their li the line will cut them off. Tonight is not about Brexit, but of course everything is about Brexit. <laughs> Research from Warwick University shows that the vote to Brexit was swung by votes of those who are most affected by austerity. And an answer for those who are most affected by austerity would be a massive investment program funded by bond issues from willing savers and a national investment bank. This is not a new idea. It's been tried successfully in many countries. It has been particularly successful in Germany. It can be the engine of growth by putting savings to work in the cause of long-term infrastructure and investment projects. Returns would far exceed the cost of borrowing, which is low anyway. It was in the last Labour manifesto. Our council member, Stephanie, has just written a book about it, The Future of National Development Banks. She will sign the book for you at the back. It's going to be on sale after the lecture. And John McDonnell, I hope, will explain how we will put it into practice when he becomes Chancellor. Then Josh will comment, and lastly, John Weeks. But first, Stephanie, a world expert on public development banks who will explore the role of national investment banks and how they can play a role in the UK economy. I want to first start by thanking um, the, for the opportunity to make the case for the value of a diversified financial system, and specifically one which includes a public national investment bank, as Labour proposes to create. My presentation will draw on the analysis and conclusions of my recently published book that Patrick already showed, but I'll, I'll take the opportunity to do it again. <laughs> Uh, which I co-edited with Jose Antonio Campo. Um, I want to particularly thank Patrick Allen for chairing and giving such fantastic support to this launch, as well as the whole PEF Council and Michael Davis for all the backing. And I'm very, very grateful, extremely grateful for and really delighted that John McDonnell will so kindly speak today at this event on the very important topic of a UK national investment bank and the role it will play in Labour's economic strategy precisely to uh, counteract the negative effects of austerity and to build a brighter future. I want to also thank John Weeks and John, Josh Ryan Collins for uh, joining our panel. One of the many very valuable proposals in the Labour Manifesto is that of creating a national investment bank to help provide much needed funding for investment and infrastructure, including Green One, and for small and medium enterprises, particularly those more likely to innovate and grow. 
More broadly, a UK NIB would be a key instrument for helping implement and contribute sufficient financial resources for an industrial policy. It would increase lending and investing in sectors key to the UK's structural transformation to an ecologically sustainable economy, help increase productivity, and contribute to higher growth of wages and living standards for the majority of people. In the wake of the 2007-2009 global financial crisis, support for national investment or development banks, as well as for the multilateral development banks, grew worldwide. A key reason was that the private financial system is pro-cyclical, lending too much in booms and rationing credit during crisis and in the aftermath. In fact, the private financial system actually cause, is a major factor in causing uh, financial crisis. Furthermore, and perhaps more relevant in our context, the financial sector often is incapable on its own to provide adequate finance at sufficient maturity and reasonable cost to small firms, as well as deliver sufficient funding for new innovative companies, infrastructure, and sustainable development projects. It insufficiently supports investment required for transformation towards more dynamic, inclusive, and sustainable economies. The key reason is that private finance on its own is very unwilling to finance investment which has uncertainty, as Keynes taught us, with uncertain returns, such as investment in new sectors, in new technologies, and in projects with environmental and other externalities, such as renewable energy, often key for structural transformation and long-term sustainable development. The failure of private finance to deliver this adequate funding in a stable and appropriate manner prompted many governments to rely more on national investment banks. They are and have been a very important feature of financial sectors of most developed and middle-income countries, especially the most successful ones, starting, as Patrick mentioned, with Germany, but also Japan, Canada, France, India, China, and South Korea. Indeed, a number of European countries in the wake of the financial crisis, like Portugal, Ireland, and most recently Scotland, recently created new national investment banks, whilst others expanded existing ones, like a very interesting French BPI. In our just published book, The Future of National Development Banks, where we analyze these banks in seven countries, we conclude that overall these banks tend to be broadly very successful at what they do. They have been very efficient development policy instruments in the various countries studied, helping overcome major market failures in a flexible way over time. They evolve over time to meet changing needs. But most crucially, they have played important roles in helping fund national development strategies to facilitate structural transformation, more dynamic, greener, and more inclusive economies. And they do this in close collaboration with the private sector, both financial, who helps fund them, and non-financial, to whom they lend. They have been innovative in several aspects. They have gone into new activities, supporting particularly innovation and entrepreneurship. For example, China's development bank, which has the trivial amount of $2 trillion of assets, uh, has actually, um, and Germany's KFW, as well as Brazil's BNDES, have supported, importantly, technological innovation. innovation. Others, like French BPI have, and Chilean Corfo, have not only supported innovation, but also supported entrepreneurship, which is an interesting new development. NDBs have played an important role in supporting new sectors. And a prime example is renewable energy and energy efficiency, which is crucial for delivering a sustainable future for all people on the planet. And I think this is very interesting because, for example, KFW was initially the sole lender to private companies who were investing in solar when it wasn't such a tried technology and wasn't so profitable. And later, private banks followed. They were, if you like, brought in by KFW. In China, this massive development bank not only designed the broad policy to encourage investment in renewables, but also 
funded it, played a major role. And if we take Germany, and especially China, they are the major actors who have promoted the spread of solar energy worldwide at an increasingly competitive cost with fossil fuel energy. So one can argue that NDBs played a major role in catalyzing this key development so essential for mitigating climate change. NDBs also have been very flexible <coughs> in the instruments that they use, such as guarantees, equity, debt funds, venture capital, as well as new instruments to fund SMEs. The UK has been a very lonely exception amongst G7 European countries in not having such a public investment bank, despite its evident need. Private and public investment has been historically low in the UK and has fallen sharply since the beginning of the 2007-08 crisis and due particularly, as, as Patrick was pointing out, in an important part to conservative government imposed austerity. The UK remains in last place among both G7 and OECD countries, with the lowest share of investment in GDP in the period 97 to 2017. It therefore seems essential for the UK to have a national investment bank along lines the Labour Party is proposing, and that builds on international experience. It's actually an advantage to create these institutions late in the day, because you can build on all the good and bad lessons from other countries. Such a bank will help fund the investment needed to support the structural transformation for a greener economy that will provide our citizens with an ecologically sustainable future and one which provides decent jobs, increases UK's productivity throughout the country, and as Labour says, it can help create an economy that serves the many, not the few. It could do this as a key instrument to help implement and contribute financial resources for a modern industrial policy that rebalances the UK economy between sectors and regions and contributes to delivering a viable ecosystem nationally and internationally. In fact, one of the problems that neoliberal economic policy has had is that they've rid the state of practically all the instruments and, and national investment banks are such an important instrument that can help governments promote um, growth in a particular way. At a more technical level, national investment banks have paid in capital, which is provided by governments, but raise long-term funds on private, national, and international capital markets to fund their long-term loans. Often their loans are co-financed by private banks or investors, and therefore they allow leveraging of public resources with private ones in a very attractive way especially valued in context of fairly limited fiscal space. So they allow governments to have large and transformative economic impact with relatively limited public resources. A sort of Keynesianism by the back door. Nash or Keynesianism in times of high debt. National investment banks lend to or invest mainly in private companies. This implies that like German KFW, and other development banks, the UK NIB would have very close <coughs> collaboration rather than competition with the private financial and non-financial sector. It is important to emphasize that national investment banks also can provide loans and equity to public entities, of course, or cooperatives. National investment banks help compensate for declines or slow growth of private credit during economic downturns providing essential funding to maintain crucial investment in bad times, which is typically the first thing that is cut, and reducing the magnitude of any downturn. It is believed, for example, that in Germany, the counter-cyclical lending of KFW contributed to maintain economic activity, particularly in the crucial SME sector. Whereas in the UK, without such a bank, th there wasn't this, uh, this kind of uh, counter-cyclical role. There is indeed clear evidence from the World Bank in its survey that national development banks worldwide in all countries have provided this very valuable counter-cyclical role in the aftermath of the global financial crisis, as lending worldwide increased by 36% between 2007 to 2009, while private banks were either shrinking their lending or increasing it very little. 
One important element in facilitating a development bank making an important contribution to finance additional investment for structural transformation is sufficient scale. I think that's one thing that we learned in our research project. Here we can draw valuable lessons from several national investment banks we studied, such as Germany's KfW, which is seen as one of the most successful and effective national development banks in Europe. And Germany, of course, is the most dynamic and diversified European economy. Indeed, with assets over 500 billion euros, KfW is one of the world's largest development banks as proportion of GDP and is one of Germany's largest commercial banks. The KfW approves loans of around 50 to 55 billion euros a year. If we do the equivalent values at the UK with around 80% of German population, we'll see that that would be equivalent to 37 billion pounds a year. And the total exposure of KW is around 500 billion euros. Um, if we assume a similar scale for the UK as proportion to its population, total exposure of the National Investment Bank in 15 to 20 years should reach about 350 billion pounds. To achieve this loan volume, assuming a leverage ratio of, of one to nine, to obtain the best possible rating. You want to have the best possible rating so you can borrow as cheaply as possible on the market. The NIB would require equity of around 40 billion pounds of public paid in capital. However, if the NIB has profits after lending commences, these could be reinvested into the bank as equity, enabling it to continue expanding volume without the need for further capital injections. And this is how uh, institutions like KFW or the European Investment Bank or the World Bank have funded their increases in capital. Furthermore, if the government provides a guarantee to the NIB, the total required paid in capital may be lower. Significant scale for NIB at the beginning is very important. So it can have a meaningful impact in helping to fulfill the industrial strategy and other aims of a labor government, which has a an ambitious agenda, and therefore you need an ambitious instrument to help support it. And the, uh, to meet the urgent task of distributing growth more evenly and fairly in different regions of the country, as labor has so rightly stressed, and of ensuring ecological sustainability. On the other hand, and economists always have to find their second hand, operations may need to be uh, increased relatively gradually to ensure high quality lending, as well as equity investment. Indeed, if we look at the history of banks like the European Investment Bank, they grew fairly slowly initially and then expanded far more rapidly, mainly for this reason. Uh, the National Investment Bank will already start by, would start being capitalized in the UK at a small scale using the fairly small British, Invest, British Business Bank and would use key parts of its lending and equity finance portfolio for SMEs. Further significant paid in capital will be needed in year one to back both infrastructure project finance and increase availability of funding for expanding SME operations. As argued in our forthcoming paper that I'm co-authoring with Max Harris and Peter Rice. It may be desirable in year one to increase equity capital by say, perhaps five billion pounds with further equity capital injections of up to 25 billion to be able to fulfill the target of total stock of lending of 250 billion after 10 years, which labor has defined in its manifesto. Indeed, as I mentioned before, in the long term, a labor government may wish the NIB to be even bigger, to be equivalent in scale to the German KfW, which would require a total um, paid in capital after a number of years of up to 40 billion pounds, ambitious. Both international experience and especially the needs of the UK economy seem to point to a UK NIB to focus on two main sectors. The first, assessing the long-term funding gap for SMEs uh, across the country with particular emphasis on innovation, sustainability, and growth. Digitalization may initially be an important part of innovation as French, for example, BPI has been focusing. This could be applied in a way that gives priority to SMEs in areas of socioeconomic deprivation, where private funding has been especially insufficient. 
and where Labour is rightly putting so much emphasis on major investment. The regional structure of the NIB should contribute to realizing the same. Addressing the long-term funding gap for infrastructure investment across the country for both physical and social infrastructure is also a second important task. Special emphasis, we think, in this paper should be placed on infrastructure that is low carbon, as, for example, infrastructure producing renewable energy and energy efficiency, infrastructure for public transport, as well as for low carbon vehicles, such as electric ones. This was contribute to the essential task of helping make investment consistent with the limits of the planet as being increasingly strongly presented in the ideas around a Green New Deal. As in other countries, the NIB would work closely with government spending on infrastructure. And therefore, it's excellent that in the UK's case, Labour is proposing to create a national transformation fund which would invest 250 billion over 10 years fund which would work closely with the National Investment Bank on funding infrastructure. The National Investment Bank will need to generate additional channels of transmission of lending to SMEs. Direct funding, also called first tier lending in the literature, seems to be the preferred model in light of the UK difficulty of getting banks to finance SMEs sufficiently. It has the advantage of supporting directly the aims of the bank and of broad government policy, for example, greening the economy. It will also support, allow support to be directly rapidly to the economy when there are these cyclical downturns and banks are still restoring their balance sheet. This can mainly be achieved, it seems, by a new regional banking infrastructure to ensure a local presence for small and medium enterprise firms. And French BPI, I think, provides a valuable precedent with its large network of branches for how this can be done successfully. Indirect funding can come also, of course, through existing commercial banks, but this should be for new lending in accordance with appropriate guidelines that could be agreed between the NIB and any bank participant. Conditionalities could be used to direct banks to support investment in the productive sector of the economy in line with the government's overall industrial strategy direction. There is evidence in the literature that where SMEs borrow more from state-owned banks relative to private banks, financial constraints are reduced for SMEs without increases in default risk. This attributes that successful result to the value of soft information on borrower quality consistent with relationship lending. This is consistent with the theoretical insight from Joe Stiglitz linked to reducing asymmetries of information, given that regional branches of the NIB could acquire detailed knowledge of sectors and companies. So the NIB would need a regional branch network. Again, it could build on existing institutions, but it will need to establish connections, therefore, it will allow it to establish connections to communities and local businesses. This would allow a national investment bank to develop relationship lending so that soft information can be well gathered. So the National Investment Bank, I think, would be a source of expertise on industrial policy as well as a source of funds. Of course, due consideration must be given not to expand too much NIB overhead costs by creating these regional branches so that their increase in cost is smaller than the potential gains which can be reached by the increase in relationship lending. A key lesson we can learn from international experience is the need to have so-called good investment banks. Good governance is very central to achieve this, including transparency and accountability. Of course, those who call on transparency from the public sector are very reluctant to impose the same transparency mm -hmm. on actors like the private sector. If you look at hedge funds, they usually, their, um, their web page usually has no information at all for the general public. But the, the, the UK Investment Bank would have very good transparency. It has a difficult task because it has to respond to government broad priorities and work closely with the private the sector, but must be independent of narrow vested interests in both so as not to be captured by either. Having an, an NIB board with skills in business and management, banking and risk, as well as equally importantly with technical knowledge of infrastructure and SME investment 
would help ensure good governance. The presence on the board of several uh, government representatives who would be involved in designing government strategy, as well as trade union representatives, SME representatives, and consumer groups would further contribute valuable perspectives. It is key that the NIB staff should have great engineering and all scientific expertise required, and not just financial skills, as commercial banks do. There should be no quantitative financial engineering-oriented staff, other than for risk management purposes. The bank will have a clear mandate, as all development banks do, to focus on SMEs and infrastructure investment, and by definition, do not do speculative investment. Instead, the focus would be on real engineering, not financial engineering, entrepreneurial and scientific skills to help deliver the NIB mandate. To support this broad mandate, the NIB will need to develop significant in-house expertise. As the work of McFarlane and Masukato shows, a key difference between successful NIBs and private financial institutions is the breadth of expertise and capacities contained within staff. KFW, BPA, BPI France, European Investment Bank include not, as I said, only financial expertise, but very much in-house engineering and scientific knowledge about the sectors and the nature of the investments being made. This means that investment decisions are focused on a wider set of criteria than just market signals, though these are important, and means they are better placed to appraise social and environmental considerations. In fact, in its initial recruitment, the UK NIB could benefit from attracting current or former staff or institutions like KFW, BPI, EIB, and indeed the UK Green Bank that has been so recently been privatized. Some of the staff could come on a temporary, where others could come on a more permanent basis. And here I want to finish stressing that the in-house interdisciplinary expertise among NIB staff will make it easier to develop an investment culture focused on achieving positive, dynamic, real economy outcomes by the UK NIB. Bank, which should be profit-making, but not profit-maximizing. Indeed, a national investment or Development Bank has both to fulfill the mandate of serving an ecologically sustainable as well as inclusive real economy and of making reasonable profits that will fund expansion of the bank so it can increasingly play these important roles. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Stephanie, for, for a very uh, detailed and authoritative talk. I think you've covered all the difficult aspects of the banks. So I'm now going to call on uh, John McDonnell, MP, who needs no introduction, I feel. Uh, he is the Shadow Chancellor of the Exchequer, and National Investment Bank is a key part of uh, Labour strategy, I believe, and you're going to tell us more about it. Thanks, thanks a lot, Patrick. Um, can I thank the... Progressive Economics Forum for organising this and the, the work that they're doing, which is superb, and also the Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose. This, this was meant to happen, this um, discussion was meant to happen a couple of weeks ago, but we, we had to defer it because um, Theresa May decided to bring forward her proposals to Parliament on her route through Brexit. That went well. <laughs> that was the, most, the biggest historic defeat in parliamentary history. Anyway, thanks for inviting me. I want to talk about exactly that, as Patrick has said. This is one of our central plans for our programme, bringing together our policy in terms of finance, business and industrial strategy. Um, as has been said, we, we committed in our last general election manifesto to establishing a national investment bank, and we published an independent report with recommendations how, how to bring that about. We may have copies of that at the back of the hall. So um, I'm delighted also there's a number of people in the audience who contributed to that report. I'd just like to express my thanks. But I want to thank Stephanie for not just the superb talk she's just given, but also the work that she's put in. Um, thank her also for an advanced copy of the book, which is available at the back, if you didn't know, <laughs> and available, could be signed as well, which is a superb piece of work. What I found is that the international perspective of her work is particularly useful. Um, it's the point she made. We want to learn the lessons from others to ensure that we get it right ourselves, so we establish the best form of a national investment bank. 
as we go into government. And what Stephanie has done is she's examined in detail over time the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank and the German KFW. And her book, launched tonight, draws on analysis of Latin America, development, Latin American development banks, as well as developments in China. We want to draw upon those lessons, definitely. And I think there are two points to be made about this that are relevant to the party's ongoing thinking about a national investment bank. And actually, Stephanie has made one of those points. First of all, uh, Stephanie's work has just highlighted that a national investment bank isn't some form of newfangled experiment. It's exactly as Stephanie has said. The, the UK now is, if anything, it's fast becoming an outlier by not having an investment bank. Second, there's much to be mined from historical experience overseas, yes, and in this country, about what an effective national investment bank should do, but also what it should not do. And, and this kind of detailed research that Stephanie's undertaken, I think, is highly informative, and it will, it will help us in, as we go into more detailed design of the features of the National Investment Bank, which we want to introduce, which will be fit for the 21st century. I want to address two questions. First of all, yes, that question of why do we need a national investment bank? And also, secondly, if it's such a good idea, why haven't we got one already? Um, I want to take the second question first. The political reaction has lagged as so often behind economic react reality in this country. Neoliberalism in the UK and elsewhere has deployed the rhetoric of smaller government in order to justify while well, in this country, large-scale cuts to vital public services. And at the same time, the same argument has been used really as tools of government to boost private contractors and even fossil fuel projects as well. Reduce government and at the same time line the pockets of these private companies and those that are putting our climate at risk. In other words, the idea that the government should be hands-off in the economy has been applied self-servingly and actually dishonestly. Around the world, yes, but rarely more so than in the UK itself. But after, I think after now decades of political attachment to the doctrine that the state has no role to play in finance, the bank bailouts of 10 years ago fatally undermined that argument and undermined the argument that the market knows best. And I found it really ironic that those who are arguing for decades about the small state, the market will always produce the right results when the financial crash occurred were the loudest calling for state intervention at the time. And the whole process did expose that actually, yes, the state guarantee always underlines banks, which are often too big to fail. So we can take some comfort from the fact now that we are gradually winning the ideas against the battle of ideas against neoliberalism. And in recent years, the neoliberal hostility to active government has actually been forthrightly challenged by progressive economists and campaigners across the piece. First of all, as the hollowness of the neoliberal agenda has become clear, we've seen a return of academic interest in industrial policy in particular. Secondly, there's been a shift in debates away from the question about whether government should be involved in steering economic development towards the more nuanced question of how a government should play that steering role within the economy itself. So before I turn to how I believe a national investment bank should play this role, let's just remind ourselves of the reasons why it's needed. The finance sector in this country is simultaneously one of the most significant industries but also one of the most problematic as well. We are the one of the most imbalanced economies in Europe. I just give the example. In inner London, inner London has an average GDP six times the European average. West Wales and the Valleys, where we've been doing some of our regional economic meetings, has a regional average of only 68% of the European average. As Stephanie emphasised, the figures are startling. We, we invest less than, any, less than other countries. And as she said, the ONS reporting last year demonstrated that our non-governmental investment was the lowest in the G7 and has been 
for the preceding 15 years. The British Business Bank reported that the proportion of SMEs applying for new loans has actually fallen from 2.9% in 2012 to 1.7% in 2017, with many with little in the way of physical assets simply not bothering to apply because they know what the answer will be to their request. As a result of all this, the UK physical, physical infrastructure is in poor shape. With transport among several sectors which has faced years of decline and neglect since privatisation, and the CBI, amongst, amongst many others, are regularly highlighting the impact this has on businesses. And I tour around the country. We're now doing small town meetings in, in areas right the way around the country, inviting local people and local party members and trade unions and businesses, civil society organisations, etc., to spend five or six hours with us on a Saturday. We attract audiences between 150 and 250 in places like Hastings, in Mansfield, in Blackpool, and last weekend in Stoke. People coming along to describe what's happening in their local economy as a result of the lack of investment within the local infrastructure. And exactly as Patrick said, it is those towns that largely voted Brexit as a result of their dissatisfaction at the way they'd been treated over the years, particularly through lack of investment. But also what's coming out of those discussions is the government's complacency on environmental issues, which has meant we lag far behind other countries in developing and diffusing sustainable resources of energy generation. Contrast us with the example that Stephanie gave of what's happening as a result of the investment that's gone on in Germany in particular. And you know, new, power, new solar power installations have halved in two years in a row following the government's cuts to subsidies. And meanwhile, some of you may have seen Graham Turner's report to us from JFC Economics. It was a report to the Labour Party last year, and it made clear the banking system is taking deposits from manufacturers and building up huge lending portfolios for real estate. And I'll just give one example. In the first quarter of last year, professional scientific and technical sectors had a £69 billion deposit surplus. So they were bringing the wealth in. And manufacturing had £15 billion surplus. While buying and selling and renting of real estate had an £83 billion lending surplus. So the productive element of the economy is creating the wealth, and the wealth is then going into property speculation. And what's been fascinating in Graham's report last year is the way in which agricultural land has increased in value and price, but agricultural production has often declined. So with all those challenges in mind, we were testing the question, what sort of mandate should a UK investment bank have? And our report for, from 2017 recommended focusing on a few areas. Some of these have been covered by Stephanie in her recommendations. First of all, addressing the long-term funding gap for small and medium enterpri enterprises. SMEs are absolutely critical to our economy. We've worked at what's happened in Germany. The Mittelstand, which is the engine of that economy as a result of the investment decisions that have been made by local and regional investment banks. Supporting, of course, the development of physical and social infrastructure. So yes, the physical infrastructure, but human capital as well, particularly through training. Funding technological research and innovation in which the UK still lags behind many other economies. And some of you will recall some of the debates that we've had with government, which cut a billion pounds out of public sector R&D. And yes, helping to rebalance the UK economy away from London and the South East. When we hold our economic seminars on a Saturday, we publish the figures often between the regional investment and the contrast between that going into London and the South East, and areas like the North East, the Midlands, and the North West. And sometimes on transport, for example, in the North East, £400 per head, in London, nearly £2,000. So no wonder people get angry when they hear about other announcements of investment in London and the South East and not within their own areas, because the, what many consider is discrimination against, it, against investment elsewhere. That's one of the reasons some of the work that we're doing at the moment, we've commissioned as a rewriting of the Treasury's Green Book which establishes the criteria by which government decisions are made around investment 
And in the criteria that will be established and will be about tackling the imbalance of investment that's taking place now. So as well as supporting other socially valuable services, as determined by the government, we have included our, our manifesto to at least double the size of the cooperative sector as well, because the creation of wealth is important, but the ownership as well is equally important. So we want to ensure that people share in the prosperity that we build as a result of the investment through the National Investment Bank. So the, national, the work of our National Investment Bank will be driven through a network of regional development banks, drawing upon greater in-depth knowledge of the local economies. At the same time, we'll be using the central power of the National Bank to make, take, macro, take a macro view of the areas where finance needs to be directed, including the areas of the country which are undeserved, underserved by the current financial system. Uh, so to achieve that goal, our report recommended an initial injection of £20 billion from Labour's National Transformation Fund, with the NIB then issuing its own bonds and building up its balance sheet to achieve a target of around £250 billion of lending after 10 years. I'm beginning to take on the image of a moderate here after listening to Stephanie's figures. <laughs> alongside, alongside that... <laughs> Not often described as that. <laughs> Alongside £250 billion of additional capital government in investment over the same first two terms of a Labour administration. And those combined to that £500 billion investment of that 10-year programme could make a huge difference, not just to the UK's economic growth rate, but also to the form that that growth then takes. So amongst the bank's mandate areas mentioned just now, perhaps the most significant is the potential for supporting our industrial strategy. Some of you will have been involved in the discussions around the work that Rebecca Long-Bailey and Chi Onwara have been undertaking in the development of that industrial strategy for Labour. And actually, yes, I want to say we owe a debt of thanks to the work of Mariana Mazzucato in helping us develop that industrial strategy. One objection often raised to a national investment bank is the idea that providing more finance will not necessarily address the shortage of profitable ventures seeking that finance. Well, I think this just misunderstands the whole argument in favour of state investment banks. You know, at least, there's at least three ways. First of all, that through its position as a state-guaranteed institution, the bank can raise its own finance more cheaply than private banks and pass on those low interest rates into companies. And there will be out there, there are out there, a number of concerns or potential ventures for whom a loan at 5% contrasted with a loan at 20% makes the difference when deciding whether to get started or to expand or even continue. Secondly, there may be expansion plans which require long-term patient investment, as Mariana has argued, which a national investment bank with a mandate to make a profit but not seek short-term profit maximisation can make the difference where others can't. And finally, by being part of the government's industrial strategy, the National Investment Bank can be part of not just fixing markets, but creating and shaping markets, and indeed creating new ones. The question of what is profitable is not a neutral one. And when the state is already involved in much of the research being done in the UK already, though receiving very little back in return for its support, surely it makes sense to use that power to drive the kind of growth we need in the areas that we need. So by creating opportunities for new firms, cooperatives and other organisations to thrive in new sectors, the state can create more takers for the National Investment Bank's lending. And those who already underwrite the transition to the economy of the future, i.e. the taxpayers of the UK, they can see some return on their investment in the long term. And I don't think, and nowhere is this clearer than in the urgent need for a step change in our attitude to climate change and potential environment, our environmental catastrophe. Of course, the impetus for decarbonising our energy section, sector must, and under labour, will come directly from government investment, particularly with regard to alternative energy sources. And as we've toured around the country, people are brimming with ideas but lacking in investment. 
and it ranges from the mayor in Liverpool, Stevie Rotherham, seeking to develop a barrage across the Mersey and set up a, its own local grid, to individual communities opposed to fracking and therefore willing to look at alternative energy sources to be developed in their particular area. So the idea that governments can simply privatise and subsidise their way out of the most complex and perilous challenge of climate change faced by any generation is simply gross negligence and arguably one of the biggest failures of the last, well, generation. The transition to sustainability will create markets for new goods as well and new goods and services at home and abroad. And these can be built and delivered in Britain as part of a green jobs revolution and the National Investment Bank will be a key part of that. So just drawing to a conclusion, there are a few key points that can't be emphasised often enough. The purpose of a National Investment Bank can never be profit maximisation, though it must be profit making. Secondly, it cannot be a disguise for a straightforward fiscal policy, though endowed with initial capital by government. Day-to-day -day decision making must be independent of government. Only if observers believe that the NIB is not acting as an arm of the Treasury, will they trust it to make the right decisions and have the reputation which the best state banks have earned, gaining them even greater access to more finance. Even with an in active industrial strategy shaping incentives, there will always be the potential for a state bank to make the same mistakes as private sector banks can prioritising quick returns instead of long-term lending, favouring lending only against tangible assets, getting into complex derivatives which can threaten financial stability. But to repeat, the culture of the National Investment Bank that we will create and its mandate will prevent this. It will be about, and it can't be repeated more often, not about profit maximising, but investment and profit making for everybody. So taking forward all these ideas and proposals coming from, forward from many of those here tonight, including, I just want to mention Peter Rice as well, who's actually in New Zealand at the moment. It's now forming a major part of our work preparing for government, where we're taking each policy, preparing the implementation manuals, drafting the legislation so it's on the shelf and we hit the deck running whenever that election comes that we will win. So we will demonstrate in the coming months as we work together that we will prepare a detailed instruction manual to lay on the desk of the civil servants on the day one of a Labour government. It's a huge task, but it's underway, and it's underway thanks to the work that many of you contributed to. So I want to thank all of those here tonight and others who aren't. Um, we're testing the ideas in our 2017 report. We're developing them further. We're integrating them with other proposals which have come forward. And that includes, for example, from the Graham Turner's work, the proposal for a strategic investment board, the discussions that we've had with others about the role of RBS, if it's kept in public ownership for the future, and also working with the CWU and others and investigating the possibility of using the post office network to establish a post bank across the country. So thank you very much for everyone who's helping or has helped, help, has helped Labour with that work. Thanks also for the speakers this evening as well, because it all adds to the, contrib the, the, it all adds to the contributions that they're making to developing our ideas, and particularly Stephanie for the book and the, and the speech tonight. Thanks to PEF too. I just want to reassure that whenever the election comes, we know it behoves us to be ready with our programme for transformative change. But it is down to yourselves, and many of you have contributed to this, that actually we will be ready as a result of this work, not just to govern, but to transform. Thank you. Thank you, John. That was a very inspiring speech. And uh, we'll have time for questions after all of our speakers. Uh, and I do recommend the Graham Turner report, which you can find online, a light read, uh, which puts some flesh on the bones as to how 
all the structure fits together, National Investment Bank, Strategic Investment Board, Treasury, Bank of England, but it's all been thought through and how it all connects, and that's still a matter of debate, but a lot of thinking has gone into it. So do pick up that report. Right, now for Josh Ryan Collins, who is uh, Head of Research at the Institution for Innovation and Public Purpose at University College, London, a new department dedicated to rethinking how value is created, nurtured, and evaluated, working closely with policymakers, including state investment banks, to help achieve mission-orientated innovation and inclusive growth. It's published a number of high-impact policy reports on patient finance and state investment banks. Copies available at the back, I think. Uh, and in particular played a key role in advising on the design of the Scottish National Investment Bank, which will become operational in 2020. Founder and director Mariana Matsukato is co-author of Chapter 10 of Stefano's book on mission-orientated finance. So, Josh, over to you. Thanks, uh, thanks very much, Patrick. Thanks for the invitation. And thanks, uh, Stephanie, for the, the excellent book. Um, I just want to say uh, that my comments will focus firstly on some of the big picture macroeconomic challenges uh, that both the UK and other advanced economies face uh, with regard to finance. Um, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about um, some of the more unique challenges facing the UK and draw um, a little bit on the research that Patrick's just mentioned that IIPP's been conducting uh, where we've done a, a couple of studies, which, as you say, you can find at the back, comparing different kinds of uh, different, different national investment banks across the UK. And I just want to give a call out to Laurie McFarlane, who's sitting in the front row here, who's actually been leading that, put your hand up, Laurie, leading that research uh, <laughs> with Mariana, with Mariana Mazzucato. Um, so he's the man to talk to for the, the, the detail on, uh, on that. But just um, the big picture, I mean, <clears throat> I think it's really important, and, and John and Stephanie have picked this up to some extent, but it's very important to just understand that the last 40 years in advanced economies, and not just in sort of ang Anglo-Saxon neoliberal economies, but in particular in those economies, we've seen an incredible uh, macroeconomic shift. Uh, it's been described as a, a debt shift. We've seen a change in the nature of debt, the type of credit that banks, commercial banks, are, are actually uh, creating, the type of lending they're doing. So just to give you the, the numbers, um, since, the, since the 1970s, the share of credit um, has roughly doubled relative to GDP. So we've had a massive expansion in, in bank lending. But at that, during that same period, the, the, the share of credit supporting non-financial firms, companies that are actually investing in new capital, new ideas, paying people, increasing their incomes over time, has actually fallen from 60% of the total to 40%. Uh, and this is the financialization story that many of you will be familiar with. And that's a, a figure uh, averaged across 18 OECD economies. In the UK, you won't be surprised to hear, it's much worse. Um, the, the share, uh, and this is Bank of England figures, the share of, uh, of total credit supporting non-financial firms was uh, around 40% in 1986. Uh, that's, uh, in the most recent figures su suggest it's fallen to around 10%. So one in 10 pounds of, of every loan that a bank makes supports the traditional textbook model of what banks do, which is lend to, to firms for investment and working capital. That is a completely dysfunctional financial sector because most of that money is supporting, is flowing into existing assets, in particular real estate assets, but also financial assets, enabling investors, uh, various forms of financial corporations to buy existing shares, to, to, to buy up other companies. Uh, and the, the effect of which is basically to raise the price of those assets. House prices go up, they become less affordable. The price of, of financial assets rises, making money for those lucky enough to own them. But it doesn't actually result in any increase in the productive capacity of the economy. It's simply capital gains flowing to an increasingly smaller number of, of people. So that is the fundamental macroeconomic challenge that we, we face, not only in the UK, but more widely. And for me, state, and state investment banks are an absolutely key tool for addressing that challenge. 
uh, because they are, as we've heard, big, potentially very, very serious macroeconomic players when you, when you allow them to be big enough and when you design them in a way that they can actually channel investment to productive parts of the economy. And there's a huge amount of research that shows that when they, they are effective, they actually have a very positive and transformative effect on private finance, on private investment. The so-called cowbell effect, uh, where the state investment bank lends to a particular sector and it sends this powerful signal to the rest of the private financial sector that this is a sector worth investing in, that this is uh, where finance should be uh, directed. So I just want to, this is a key point for, for IIPP, that uh, the existence of these sort of public banks is not just about correcting market failures or providing for public goods or meeting externality problems. These institutions are actually about shaping and co-creating better markets, markets that actually support uh, increases in productivity, support uh, greater equality and build real wealth, not just rentier-type capital gains. I think that's a, a really important point to, to underlie. Now, what are the challenges facing the UK, the particular challenges? Well, some of them, I think, have already been picked up. I think um, both Stephanie and John have talked about the, the challenge of relationship banking. One of the reasons that commercial banks have drifted towards property uh, in lending is because um, that actually property lending is very attractive if you're, a, if you're a bank because if the loan goes bad, you get the house in return. You get the house as, as collateral. If you lend to a business, usually they have limited liability. The loan goes bad, you get nothing in return. There's also the high transaction costs, particularly lending to a, a small business. So the way that the, the successful public banks de-risk their loans is they actually build relationships with firms over time. And this is the story of the Sparkasse and the Mittelstand in Germany. They build relationships with firms. They get to know the local and regional economy. And they don't need collateral. They don't need the house of the company entrepreneur in order to, to make the loan. I think the real challenge in the UK is, is how we recreate that kind of relationship banking because we've really lost it. You know, we, we did used to have smaller, more regionally based banks. How do you recreate it? And for me, this is an argument for looking at our existing banks, uh, especially those that are sort of partially publicly owned, and thinking about how we turn them into a sort of German Sparkassen model supported by a big state investment bank behind them. We need that kind of ecosystem uh, in order for the money that the state investment bank is providing to get into the regions, particularly those where there's less economic activity. I think there's also a major sort of political challenge for the UK, uh, I mean, Patrick was talking about austerity at, at the beginning, um, in actually just how we define debt uh, and, and deficit. So in most advanced economies, um, there is a, 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 a term for uh, the, the definition of, of government debt. It's called general government gross debt. And it excluded from that definition are the liabilities of what's called public corporations that would include... Uh, state investment banks. So most countries would exclude the liabilities of their state investment banks. Um, in this country, we don't. We include uh, the liabilities of public corporations, arm's length, publicly owned bodies in the measure of government debt. We're almost unique in, in doing that. Um, I'll just give you an example of what this actually means, and this again, drawing on, on Laurie's work actually, but in 2015, Germany's general government gross debt, excluding uh, the, the, the liabilities of the KFW, stood at 71% of GDP. If you'd use the UK definition of, of government debt, so public sector net debt, it would, it would have been 181% of GDP, uh, and we would have presumably, be, uh, Germany would have been presumably in a, a state of, of crisis, being double uh, Kenneth Rogel's 90% of GDP um, preferred measure of. Uh, uh, of a sustainable deficit. So I think, I think politically it's, it's probably quite important for Labour to think about that definition and change it uh, back to what uh, you know, the standard uh, advanced economy model is. Because of course when a, when a state investment bank creates an asset, uh, sorry, when a state investment bank makes a loan, it creates an asset 
that counterbalances the liability, the, the debt, right? It, it's, you know, you build an affordable house, you build a bridge, you build a road, you're creating an asset that provides a flow of services. It increases the productivity of the economy. It's madness to say, to just completely ignore that and only look at the right-hand side of the balance sheet at the, at the liability. But that's actually what we, we do. And in doing so, we obviously undermine the value of state, uh, state investment banks. We also have a major problem with Brexit in this area because, uh, don't hate to bring it up, but it, but it has to be done. Uh, the EIB, the European Investment Bank, is an absolutely massive investor in the UK uh, infrastructure. Um, just to give you the, the sort of gloomy uh, figures on this, and of course the EIB you know, will stop funding us uh, if we do leave the, the EU, and it's already cut its investment by 87% since the referendum in June 2016. But, but the figures are, since joining the EU in 1974, the UK's infrastructure has been the beneficiary of 118 billion euros of lending from the EIBB, uh, including energy, transport, water, affordable housing. In 2015 alone, the EIB provided 5.6 billion for 40 different projects in the UK, amounting to approximately one third of total funding for UK infrastructure. So um, that's a big financial hole uh, that is about to appear, and actually the government's done very little so far to address it, but the House of Lords re released a report last week calling for the creation, or at least a consultation on the creation of a UK infrastructure bank. So I think that's, that's another really important issue. I just want to finish with a couple of points coming out of the research that Mariana and Laurie have been doing on how you actually design a state investment bank uh, that actually works based on quite in-depth case study research of a number of different organizations. The first point I think is this, is this mandate is, is really important and, and John mentioned uh, the importance of this. What, one thing we would argue I think is that <clears throat> a lot of state investment banks have been very sector focused. So, you know, you identify a sector that, that seems to be creating value, um, you know, and, and you just plow money into it um, and, and you hope for the best. Um, we would argue against that. We would say actually what, what the what state investment bank should be focused on is the broader, longer term objectives, what we call missions of the government of the day, uh, whether that's decarbonizing the economy, uh, whether that's cleaning the oceans, whether that's creating affordable housing. And then rather than picking winners, rather than picking, picking particular sectors or particularly, particular large firms who you've got to know well, um, uh, you're picking the willing, you're picking those companies or those sectors that are coming with you on that journey towards that, that mission. And I think that's, that's really, really important. Um, <clears throat> also important, I think, are, are governance arrangements. I think it's very important that a state investment bank is relatively independent from the government of the day. The more political a state investment bank is, the more politically influenced it is, the more likely it is that when the next government comes along, they'll just get rid of it. And that's the great, that's the great danger with these kinds of, of institutions. Um, so a, a, a level of independence is really important and a wide range of stakeholders, business, trade unions, um, civil society, communities need to be uh, rep represented. Funding is also really important. How do we make sure that a, a state investment bank has what we call patient sources of patient finance? Because what, that is what is needed actually when you're trying to innovate, when you're trying to create a new socioeconomic trajectory for your economy, whether it's, it's green energy or it's artificial intelligence or it's, it's better healthcare, um, you need finance that is stable and secure and not flighty. What we've got stuck with is, is flighty finance. Um, so I, in that sense, I think equity, forms of equity investment are clearly an important way forward. I think we're much too focused on debt in this economy, which you know, creates a very unequal relationship between the lender and the debtor. And of course, with equity, it gives the state investment bank the chance to earn something in return for its investment. It's not taking all the risk. It's, it's earning a return. And I think uh, having a wide portfolio of projects 
uh, where the less risky ones essentially are subsidizing the, the higher risk ones, which may go wrong, because it's really important to have experimentation is really, uh, really important. Um, and I'll, I'll finish there, I think. But, but, you know, I think picking up on one of, one of John's points, um, when, when he mentioned the, um, you know, the, the financial catastrophe of, of 2008, I mean, one thing that was very noticeable about that is the, uh, the Bank of England was extremely, you know, relatively effective, really, in its, in its lender of last resort uh, uh, role. I think we have a strong lender of last resort. What we're actually missing, of course, is an investor of first resort. We have no institution to direct finance in the areas that it needs to flow to shape better capitalist markets um, for the good of uh, our people. Thank you. Thank you very much, Josh. And we'll, we'll pick up on all these points in our Q&A in a moment. But first, I want to call on John Weeks. Uh, John is a council member of PEF. He is a former professor of economics at uh, SOAS, uh, and he will comment on the contribution so far. Thank you, John. Thank you. Uh, <coughs> when I'm on the panel, uh, Patrick can put me last because I'm always very keen to get onto the drinks and the snacks. So, <laughs> so uh, I won't keep you long. <coughs> One thing uh, uh, that Josh said, and I would agree with, um, the, the failure of UK banks, private banks, commercial banks, to fund productive projects is not a market failure. It is a logical outcome of deregulation. We're living with the consequence of 30, 40 years of neoliberalism. Um, I want to um, relate the National Development Bank to fiscal policy. Fiscal policy is three parts, if you think about it. There are phases, you might say. It has a short-run counter-cyclical phase. That's when we have a labor government, we'll have an active fiscal policy. I think I can depend on that. Uh, that we get all depending on that. And what you do in the short run is you keep the economy near its potential. And you do that primarily by using current expenditure. You raise, um, or the current account. Uh, uh, if you're below capacity, there are things you can do quick. You can um, increase child allowances. You can pay teachers more, policemen more, or uh, give them one-off bonuses. That simulates the economy. Uh, when the, when the economy is overheated, you can uh, raise our taxes. The second phase is a medium-term phase, and that's the role of the capital account, the capital budget. That repairs the infrastructure, <laughs> the roads, all of the, all of the public uh, facilities, schools, hospitals, so on. Third phase is a transformation of the economy. At the moment, we have no vehicle for doing that. We have a vehicle, it, they haven't been used properly, but we have a vehicle for counter-cyclical interventions. We have a vehicle for increasing the potential of the existing uh, infrastructure. The National Development, the National Investment Bank provides a vehicle for the transformation of the economy. And it can be independent and should be independent I agree with that, precisely because it is involved in a long-run function. Now, um, Stephanie referred to the manifesto and the phrase in the manifesto which said, labor is going to build an economy that works for the many not for the few. That's actually only half of the promise in the manifesto. The other half is that economy will be built by the many, not the few. 
And that is absolutely essential to both the Labour Manifesto and a radical economic program. And the National Development Bank, along with cooperatives, along with other forms of ownership, will be one of the major vehicles by which the many will not only gain from the functioning of the economy, but will construct it. An economy constructed by the few will not work for the many. We need an economy built by the many, and the National Development Bank will be part of that. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. Well, we're working very well to time. I think everyone is keen to get to the drinks and snacks. But first, uh, we have some time for questions and answers. And uh, I think we have some roving mics, although I can't see from the... Uh, Michael there's got mics, and hands are going up. So the panel must stand by and brace yourselves. Uh, so um, this person... Yes, this one here. Uh, we'll take three at a time, and then, uh, and then we'll answer those. You give their names. Uh, Chuck, right. yeah. Thank you very much. And my name is Juan Miranda. I'm from Chile, an economist, and I've been uh, working in the city of London for about 30 years now. And uh, probably some of you might realize why. And uh, uh, I cut my professional teeth in Corfo, that's a Chilean national development bank. So in a way, I feel that uh, I have balanced professional experience. National development banks on one side, city of London uh, said, uh, financial markets on the other. And uh, perhaps uh, I, that has given me uh, one angle that uh, I feel is not yet uh, in the discussions. Yeah. And uh, it is a fact that we're talking perhaps about just macro policies. My professional experience has been on the micro side of the financial markets. And uh, just to give two or three uh, examples. Mm. The International Finance Corporation, which I knew when I was a young professional, has been very much in my mind. In my experience, uh, I realized that in the 80s, uh, they provided funding for the creation of the first emerging market fund, investing in emerging markets, equities, and bonds. <coughs> uh, in the 90s, the International Financial Corporation provided funding for the first Chilean fund manager that invested in a small and mid-sized companies in Chile. Now, why cannot we also think that the National Development Bank here or elsewhere can do that sort of contribution to the financial markets? I think that the financial markets, uh, if we, some of us remember, uh, John Kay led uh, the retail market review because of the uh, shortest mission of uh, financial markets. And uh, so that's something that needs to be addressed as well. Short-term, uh, say, the financial decisions are putting a break on the, uh, financial for the long term. And that has to be sorted out somehow. There are tools. Sometimes we might think about investment trusts, which you might also call patient capital, and then that should be fostered as well. We should put that in the equation. So we must now build the second pillar, not just micro policy for national development, but we also must build into the tools to allow the financial markets to be liberated from short-term approach. Okay. And uh, if there is any uh, elaboration in that uh, uh, direction, I'd like to hear about it. Thank you very much. Stop here. Hi, Graham Hunter. Um, could you say a little bit more about who would initiate these investments, the criteria that would be used to appraise them, how they would be managed, and could you contrast that with the way the private sector handles investments? And there's a hand here.
Uh, yeah, I've got a question for uh, John. Um, you talked about the role that an NIB would play in uh, the uh, shaping the decarbonisation of the economy, and you referred to the Mersey barrage. Uh, I think you talked about you know, uh, government cuts to investment in solar panels. Uh, I was just wondering, do you envisage an NIB uh, having any role in the funding and development of new nuclear power stations? <laughs> right, we've got three there to get ourselves going. John, do you want to start? On the last one, not if I can help it. We can start on the other. In terms, uh, not if I can help it. Um, uh, we've, as a party, democratically, we've, we've made a decision around support for existing nuclear. Um, but I uh, personally, I'll be arguing against the use of this for the development of nuclear. But that will be part of that democratic debate that will that will, that will have. I, I, th I think the decarbonisation programmes and ideas that are bubbling up at the moment offer us a, an alternative that we wouldn't require nuclear to participate in. Uh, and as I say, it's interesting because the, if you look at what's happened in Germany in particular, it's often been small-scale developments that have been um, owned by the local community and, and the local community uh, derive the benefits from those alternative energy sources as well. So I think there's, there's real opportunities of wind and wave and solar that enable us to take it forward. But it does mean that it's the point that um, Joshua made. It does need a, a direct mission-driven approach if we're going to do it. And it's got to be a big focus on it. That's why Jeremy spoke about the Green New Deal at Labour Party conference, and it went down incredibly well with support. In terms of the other questions about who initiates the criteria that will be developed and, and who will undertake it, that's part of the discussions that we're having at the moment. But the What's interesting, as I say, just doing the grassroots work of touring around the country, there's no lack of ideas, there's no lack of um, organisations and individuals coming forward with what they feel that could un be undertaken at their local level to transform the local economy alongside the state investment that's going in. Um, and uh, again, some of it is just basic and other elements of it are quite remarkably I think exciting. I, I always, I've just been given the ex example in a couple of meetings I've had recently where I went to an area called Pendle where I worked years ago and they, we had a community meeting in which they came forward and said all we need is for you to reopen the railway line between Colne and Skipton uh, because what that will do is that it will give us the infrastructure that will enable us then to develop a number of sites here for the bubbling up of the ideas that we've got and again they're campaigning against fracking up there as well so and it was a, a relatively low cost project and I said certainly um, and it would open up the investment opportunities both public and private sector to that particular area but also those other other ideas bubbling up about the development of cooperatives that could be established along that route uh, when I got back to London, Andy MacDonald, our Shadow Secretary of State, said, stop visiting places and opening up railway lines, will you? <laughs> uh, I was in some difficulty because the local campaign has brought forward a petition I'd signed 30 years ago supporting it, so I have been <laughs> blackmailed, really. I don't think there's any idea, problems about initiation, but also there's lots of other activities that are going on at the moment. So, for example, we've been working with Matty Brown up in Preston about the Preston model around collaborative councils and how they can use local public procurement to, for, first of all, to repatriate investment back into their area, along with the other anchor institutions of universities, the police and the NHS, as well as the local council, but how they can then start directing that investment into developing local ventures in their particular area with a number of set criteria. And some of the criteria then are determined uh, often by the mandate that will be given to the bank nationally, but also the development of the, the localised mandate as well to the regional, regional development banks that we want to, to initiate. The issue of who is quite important. The, our idea of a national investment bank is to set up the mandate and the criteria that will then, it, it will be an on-lender. So we want to work with existing small-scale banks and other institutions. That's why we're looking at the uh, in terms of using the development of post-bank as well, and other organisations that will then be, will be the, the on-lending organisation from the NIB. And the reason we're looking at that is because initially 
there's a real issue of capacity building in this particular sector, in an, in an area of activity which hasn't been developed by the private sector but needs to be developed over time. And we need to walk before we can run, and that's one of the challenges that we've got now, but how we develop incrementally over time. And again, that will come about where we target the development of that capacity initially too, and a lot of that will be in some of these smaller towns and elsewhere that haven't had the resources in the past. I agree with you with the point, the, the chilling example that, that was made about how we develop financial markets so they're no longer short term and that actually they develop within sectors that are enable to people to access capital that will in, and give them a steady flow of investment over a, a longer period of time. And that's why we've emphasized we are not about profit maximization, mm -hmm. profit making, yes, but the argument that Joshua and, and Laurie and others have put forward about long-term stable patient investment. Joshua, you want to come in on criteria of lending? Yeah, I mean, just on the very important evaluation uh, point uh, from this gentleman, I think that is a, a real challenge because the sort of standard toolbox that you know you have in your green book, your HM Treasury green book, is very much focused on you know sort of cost benefit analysis type approaches, mm -hmm. where essentially you're sort of assuming that um, you're making a small change in this part of the economy and kind of everything else is staying the same. You sort of have to make this assumption and then it's a sort of allocative efficiency approach. But the very raison d'etre of a state investment bank is to create dynamic change over time across you know, the whole economy to change the price of solar power or, or energy more broadly um, so that it affects multiple sectors and multiple prices, which means that allocative efficiency model doesn't, doesn't work. So you do need a different approach to evaluation, which can allow for much more longer term structural changes that that state investment bank can create to be properly understood. Can we take some more questions? Can I say something? No, Stephanie. So, Stephanie, sorry. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to comment uh, on, on the two first questions I thought were excellent. In, in the case of the points that Omar made about um, long term investment, I think one key aspect is that, of course, there are these institutions like pension funds and insurance companies that have this very long-term savings. And a key challenge is how to channel that to long-term investment. And one of the problems is that the private financial sector is so dysfunctional because it takes that long-term money and invests it in very short-term modalities through mutual funds and hedge funds and so on. And I think Omar rightly pointed out, for example, the IFC has got a very interesting scheme whereby it has attracted insurance company money for several billions of dollars to help fund its portfolio of investments all across um, uh, the developing world. And if one can think of ways of doing that in the UK, that, that would be actually an excellent issue is how you take the money from the pension fund. We've been talking about this for years. There have been a number of very good miners report and others, but it hasn't properly been done. And I think the kind of strategic vision that Labour has would facilitate that. For example, in Chile also, private pension funds, I don't recommend the privatization of pension funds in Chile, it's been a, quite a disaster, but it did help provide long-term finance for infrastructure, for example. And so, because it goes directly without a lot of intermediation and churning of the city into these long-term projects. So I think that's a very interesting. And on the mandate um, and, and the criteria, I think uh, there are kind of like two areas where a, a development bank can, can perform. One is the sort of bread and butter demand where, um, if you like, there are market failures. So there are good ideas that the private sector has or local institutions have local councils and they don't get enough funding from the private sector and the NIB could fund it. But then there's the second area, which is the sort of Mariana Masukato, Laurie, Josh uh, line, which is, if you like, creating the supply, having a vision, mission oriented, and you decide in a major way to go for green or go for healthcare or aspects like that. And then you can have instruments within that. You can say, okay, I think the shadow price of carbon is much higher than the market price. And the European Investment Bank actually does that. They evaluate all projects, whether fossil fuel 
or renewables using a much higher carbon price. And, uh, and, that, and that could help. Or you can say, we don't want to fund any more coal, so, like KFW does. So you, you can use uh, instruments for, for, for those criteria. Can I come back? There's a, something significant about the change of a culture. Jo Joshua mentioned this as well, Stephanie. What we're trying to do is change the overall culture. So it isn't just about setting up a national investment bank. It's also opening up a debate about the role of the Bank of England. So exactly. we're consulting at the moment about the Bank of England mandate. Graham Turner threw in the exactly. idea of um, having productivity as one of its ambitions and targets and looking at macro potential policy to enable mm. that to happen. The, the revision of the Green Book for the Treasury, which is about uh, addressing inequality, tackling climate change, etc. The discussions that we're having with pension funds, rail, whether it's the Rail Pension Fund, as, as it now is, Schroders and others. And when I was a youngster, when I was a kid, I was involved with the NUM and on the management of the Mine Workers Pension Fund as well, where we did establish the principle of using pension funds for investment in mining mm. communities, but it never got driven through, really, because the culture changed. Mm. All of those elements, um, all of those elements, combined with the National Investment Bank, mm. with a new government, you can change, you can change the culture mm. about how we look towards our economy. And that's the, the part of the, the venture that we're on. Patrick, can I say a quick thing about it? <coughs> exactly. In that context, <coughs> John, one aspect of what you're suggesting for the National Investment Bank is the decentralization. I think you might consider uh, the possibility of citizen participation, representatives from, uh, you know, NGOs, from uh, labor groups, just from citizens' organizations. Yeah. That's done, strangely enough, by the Federal Reserve System, and in a progressive period, it can be quite important. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Right, uh, some more hands, please. Uh, lots going up. Uh, well, okay, so is that a, a lady there? I saw your hand first, I think. That's uh, there, that's it. Hi, sorry. Can you yeah, a bit of uh, Charlotte Chase, and with the Infrastructure Forum, um, we've done significant work on the role of the European Investment Bank, mm -hmm. yeah. brilliant impact that had on UK infrastructure investment, and have expressed concern over the UK's future relationship with the European Investment Bank. We contributed quite significantly to the House of Lords report mentioned earlier. Yeah. Um, overall, I think we need a more immediate solution to the current lack of investment in infrastructure. Um, a third country agreement with the European Investment mm -hmm. Bank should be explored on that basis. And also, there are a number of Treasury and IPA existing facilities that could significantly boost investment in, in infrastructure. But as part of that piece also, I'd be very interested to understand the panel's opinions on the role of private investment in infrastructure. I know Stephanie highlighted the importance of this earlier in funding the National in Investment Bank. But more broadly, the European Investment Bank will only put up 50% of the funding for a project. The rest of that does come from the private sector. So how does the private sector Factor in the relationship with the European or with the UK investment bank. I'm interested in how uh, a national investment bank might relate to the credit union movement and the work that the credit union movement is involved in in trying to uh, assist the poorest in our community whose finances are often racked by. Uh, the failure of the existing banking system, um, and uh, so what uh, might be the relationship to enable credit unions really to become more secure and provide a wider service? Okay, and uh, Michael, some hands over here. Uh, um, so we've heard from Stephanie and the rest of the panel that national investment banks are valuable, common sense, and globally widespread. So I'd like to know what the arguments that will be raised by the right, um, bad faith or otherwise, against national investment banks will be, and what our answers to that will be when we leave here. <laughs> Sorry, John, you want to kick off? Okay. Um, basically, the arguments against it is this is the mad Marxist John MacDonald 
<laughs> um, borrowing at length, that he was going to nationalise everything as a result of this money and send most of you on a re-education camp in Bolton. <laughs> and that's the standard line coming out of the Telegraph and the Daily Mail and the Express at the moment. Um, their big argument is that they just come at us and say this is more and more borrowing and then we demonstrate to them how much they've borrowed over the last eight years as a result of government failure to invest and the argument gets pretty deflated as a result. Um, but I, th I actually think we're, I, I just think we're winning. It's the common sense argument overall. Um, and it's interesting, I, I, tour, I tour the city meeting asset managers, etc. cetera. Um, yesterday I met City UK and others setting out our policies and the issue for us is to say to them, if, you know, this, it's the point that Stephanie made, this model works every, in so many other places in successful economies Part of the reason we've got the economic problems that we've got is because we're not using every effective model that's available to us. It's, it's like having a tool but not pick, being, you know, it's like having a tool available to you and not using it. And it's just, I think we're going to win the argument eventually. And the way the Tories are going at the moment, they're stealing most of our ideas so, and they're not doing it particularly well. So I wouldn't be surprised if they came up with it themselves and whatever. Uh, but no, I think it's the borrowing argument they keep on throwing against us. And we're just saying that we're, we're borrowing to invest and it's nothing on a scale that's untoward, as Stephanie has demonstrated, and it's borrowing to grow. When I go in the city and when I meet with industrialists as well, our whole theme is about invest to grow, invest to grow. And it's just common sense. And our, the fiscal rule that we developed was ensuring that, um, yes, we're not going to borrow for day-to-day -day expenditure, but we are going to borrow to invest. And that fiscal rule was designed by Simon Wren Lewis, Joe Stiglitz, and a, and a number of others, some are here today. And I think it's just common sense. And we just have to keep battering that, that down. Um, can I just come back to the EIB question? Within 10 days of the um, referendum, um, I did a speech on the South Bank and set out a number of the sort of uh, issues that we um, were concerned about and then we needed some government maybe cross-party support for. And one of them was to maintain our participation in the IB because actually mm. we get a good deal. It's an excellent deal. Um, the investment comes in, you know, their, their credit rating is better than ours. It's, and the amount of money it's gone into basic infrastructure outside of London, the southeast as well, is, is everything we need. And it's just cutting off our noses to spite our face to actually pull away from it in the way that the government is doing. And we've been arguing for the opportunity of ensuring that we maintain our participation in it, and we've got a fairly high percentage part, uh, investment in it overall. Um, we'd like, the point you make about, uh, that was made about climate investment, etc. we want more flexibility on that around match funding and, and elements like that, which we can provide that through our own NIB. I thought the Treasury report, by the way, was excellent. It was a good analysis, and it all points to the fact that actually we could be bereft of a large amount of investment mm. as a result of what I think is a lunatic policy of pulling out. But it is largely ideological rather than pragmatic um, uh, that, the, that is coming from the government at, at the moment. In terms of the credit union stuff, what we've been trying to do is look at credit unions as one of those online lending vehicles, and we want to try and invest and develop the credit union uh, movement overall. So we'll try to do that, both in terms of what we do with regard to the NIB, but also as a result of some of the other um, straightforward governmental, departmental support that we, we can give to, particularly in areas that are at the moment. Um, as you saw this week from the ONS figures, steeped in high levels of, of debt, and as a result of that um, well, destitution and insecurity that we're facing at the moment. Stephanie, do you want to come? Yeah, um, on the EIB, I mean, I totally agree with the question, with what John has just said. Um, I think it may be a bit difficult to be a third country because I, I was thinking about this because neither Norway or Switzerland, who are perhaps the closest to the EU, are, are members. But I think the UK is such an important actor, such a large part, as you said, of the capital. Um, and there was this interview in the Financial Times that the president of the EIB gave where he said that <coughs> he would be quite keen to keep the British because for them it would be a big hole. In the same way it would be a big hole for us to lose the investment, for them to lose the capital. So I think that would be a very important um, line to, to, to pursue. Um, it's true that the EIB lends 
co-finances with the private sector, except in poor countries or countries in crisis like Greece, with some exceptions. But I mean, that's one modality. You don't have to always co-finance. KFW, for example, lends through private banks, but it doesn't co-finance, and it's up to, uh, to the Labour government to think about how they would want to do that. I think on this challenging of our ideas, um, of course, the, the kind of theoretical line is that financial markets are, private financial markets are so efficient that you sh the, the least you interfere, then the better. And therefore, a public development bank is, is very bad because you're interfering with private efficient financial markets. I think that line has sort of been whittled down quite a lot by the global financial crisis. Um, and, uh, you know, to, to say that they're efficient is a little bit silly. Um, but uh, I think uh, the, the real reason, of course, is that they feel they want to, uh, private interests want to make as much money as possible with short-term maximization of profit. Um, I think one way of attracting the private sector is this idea, A, that we work in complement with them, that the NIB, and like all development banks, including the Chinese one in a communist country, I mean, they fund themselves in the market, they lend to private companies. It's a compliment. And the second is this idea of leverage. If you want to be fiscally responsible, um, you know, you, you, with little fi fi uh, fiscal resources, you can have a lot of leverage, have a lot of impact. So it sort of attracts both people on the left who want to uh, use government resources to maximum effect and people more on the right who say, well, this is one way of funding the private sector in an e efficient and complementary way. So I, I think one can kind of minimize this. It's a bit more difficult in the UK and the US because I think this country is so dominated by kind of mm -hmm. financial interests and the city and it doesn't have this kind of long-term perspective. But I think, I think Labour the academics have been trying to educate them a bit. Mm -hmm. Josh, is it right that the state can't pick, win pick winners? What about British Leyland? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think on the picking winners, I mean, I think the picking winners argument will be the main yeah. sort of yeah. bat that will be beaten round one's head on this one. And, and as I already said, really, I think the way to deal with that is to make it very clear in how the, the state investment bank is structured that it is focused on, you know, on missions, on broad government policy objectives rather than on right. sectors. Yeah. Uh, and that way you avoid this sort of accusations of nepotism and favouritism. Mm. And I think that's, that's really important. I, th I think the other point, just to say, Again, going back to my earlier point, is if you pre even if you present a quite a right-wing, you know, free market, liberal, neoliberal government with an op opportunity to uh, massively expand um, spending without it counting against a public sector mm. deficit, uh, it's quite a hard one to, to mm. turn down. Even if you know they might they might sort of happily support the Daily Mail line. In reality, uh, that, that they may be quite reluctant to, to you know to to, to not engage in that sort of opportunity. There's a line of attack. MacDonald cooks the books to take it off. You can see. Once it's there, then you're okay. <laughs> about, about five years ago, um, one of our council members, Robert Skidelsky, proposed in the House of Lords um, a uh, national investment bank uh, because of something I'd written. He included me in his group. It, you won't be surprised, it came to nothing. Uh, the, um, there was absolutely no interest, uh, I think probably beyond Robert, uh, at least on, um, um, on the government side. Second thing, I, I would just like to in emphasize what um, Stephanie said about the financial sector and the overwhelming size of it. There's been a study done jointly by uh, Institute at University of Massachusetts Amherst and by uh, Sheffield. Uh, demonstrates that uh, <coughs> Britain is one of the uh, case studies and that the, uh, as the financial sector has grown in Britain, that has actually discouraged the development of industry, mm. partly through the exchange mm. rate uh, mechanism, but also through the shifting of lending to non-productive uh, uh, services. And if anyone's interested in that, uh, just email me at PEF and I can send you the link. Okay, so time for a few more questions. Um, where is the microphone? Oh, right. So there's a big hand just there. Um, hi, uh, I'm a student at SOAS uh, in economics. So I have a question related to Brexit. 
uh, which is, uh, depending on what, whatever is the outcome, whether it's no deal or some version of the checkers plan, if, are you planning to fit the National Investment Bank strategy within, let's say, uh, uh, a checkers sort of deal? And is that why you want to make sure that it's not part of fiscal policy? Because reading the Labor Manifesto of 2017, you want to revitalize industry, nationalize certain industries, so wouldn't a state investment bank actually work better as part of that coordinated deal? Um, so is it because you would not want to violate the single market sort of rules, the competition rules, that's why you don't want the NIB to be able to, uh, or, or to you know, support fiscal policy, because it would make sense that it's not like kind of an amputated arm on its own, it's part of like a coherent economic strategy for revitalization, such as you know, universal housing, other things. So I just wanted clarification on that, um, because you mentioned about independence, but that kind of goes its own way, right? It's usually a neoliberal argument to say that uh, this bank will self-regulate, right? So anyway, yeah, thanks. Okay. And there's a hand here. I didn't quite understand. Um, hi. Uh, the question is around the concept of it should be a profit-making bank. Uh, but can you really achieve the, the required step change in renewable energy and other uh, missions uh, if you are running a profit-making bank, especially if it has high costs spread with branches around all the regions? Can you really balance these two objectives? Hi, my question is, uh, well, some of the panel touched on it um, a bit, but what, what are some of the problems or dilemmas or trade-offs you might face with, when placing emphasis on the national or the regional within a national investment bank or a framework of regional ones? Um, and the context to that question is, if, if the objective is to rebalance the economy, um, what are we really aiming to do? Is, is it about creating a block of innovative and dynamic kind of urban centres to challenge the financial uh, centre of London? Or is it about raising the bar and spreading out to as much of the country as possible, which would kind of more naturally be done a, on a national strategic level? Okay. John, the Brexit question for you. Um. I just, the NIB initiative stands in its own right as part of the overall economic strategy. It's not, it's not dependent on, I don't think it's, de it shouldn't be dependent on whatever deal comes out of Brexit. Mm. But if whatever deal comes out of Brexit, and so especially if there's no deal, the urgency of the need for a national investment bank becomes that much greater. Um, and as I said earlier, the, the issue for us is looking at those areas that did um, maximise the Brexit vote because of that lack of mm. investment over time. And it is about social cohesion as well. So I, I actually think it stands in its own right, but Brexit makes the need for an overall economic strategy that invests to grow the economy in a way which uh, that investment is e e more equally distributed around the country and where prosperity is more equally shared, make, I think makes it that much more urgent an issue. So these structures that, are, that we want to put in place, uh, we want to get the legislation through very, very quickly for an NIB, and we want to get it up and running as rapidly as possible, because alongside the government's, it's, it's John's pro uh, whole analysis of what you do in terms of fiscal policy this has to be applied fairly quickly in every way we possibly can, both in terms of the capital expenditure from government and, in, and in the NIB investment strategy as it grows, because people are pretty, I think, desperate out there. We're we faced with um, a government that, in every debate on the economy, gets up and tells us how many jobs they've created uh, and how wages are suddenly increasing. But when you when you go around the various areas, you discover how many of those jobs are actually part-time, insecure, mm. uh, and some of the definitions <coughs> of employment in this country is people mm. working under not five hours. It's extraordinary, really. And the levels of low pay across the economy um, at the moment, it's hard to see how people are surviving at all, particularly when you take housing costs into account. So 
we're, we're absolutely committed to get this up and running as rapidly as possible. I think this issue around profit-making profit um, on some projects around, I think the, one of the issues around making sure they are profit-making is making sure you take into account the length of time in which you give projects to enable them to come into profitability. And it is, you know, it's what Joshua and Ari and Mariana have been saying time and time again, it is about long-term, stable, patient. The emphasis on patient, I think, is, is important to us as well. Uh, and in that way, I think that you're, you're enabled then to take into account the way in which uh, investment in some regions may take a longer period of time to gain the profits, that, the profit-making role that, that you'd want. Um, and we've got to break this sort of a lot, a logarithmic type of way in which projects are assessed. Um, and, and i just give the example of what happens with the Green Book at the moment and transport. Of course... What will happen is, is that the civil servants will produce the analysis which says if you invest in this area, um, there's lots of passengers, so you'll get, it'll be that much more productive. And so that's why all the investment will go into London and the South East. But actually what you want to do is invest in a region which produces a transport infrastructure that generates the passenger travel because of the work that will <coughs> be created in that particular area. So it is taking a different view about the longevity investment as well as about the quality of it too. Um, the issue for us about um, rebalancing the economy is, yes, on a macro level, look at where that investment is needed. Uh, and there's, I think there'll be a mixture of innovative centres, as uh, has been described. But in, interestingly enough, there's, I think some of this will be organic as well. And a lot of the organic developments are interestingly linked to educational establishments. And it's the point I made, maybe mm. people didn't pick it up, is that a lot of state investment does go into research, mm. but it then never produces the rewards mm. for the wider community that it should. So and I, I'll give them one example. Up in Middlesbrough, the, a group of young people stayed behind after university, and they set up a, a, a project. They were all into... Uh, media, so they set up a games project where they were developing games, and um, they went. And what they do is they go along to um, companies that have existing games, and they just offer an enhancement. And as a result of that, they've built up a little games cluster within Middlesbrough with a bit of support from the local authority, giving them a venue to to develop it on. So some of this will be organic, but it's interesting how it's related to the investment that we'll be putting into universities in, in particular and research departments to enable that to happen. Yeah, Stephanie. I mean, just to even a bit more what John just said, I mean, a lot of these national investment banks internationally put a lot of money into, into research at universities because they realize that that may be, uh, you know, working very closely with private companies, that that may be a very productive way of doing it. Um, I think this issue of profit making, it's quite interesting because institutions like the KFW actually make quite a bit of profit. I mean, it's not their main aim, but they're not loss making because you can also cross subsidize between sectors. You can have sectors where you're taking more risk, but you're also potentially making more profits. And I like very much this idea of Mariana and Laurie, that you should cap try and capture the upside. You should take equity stakes so that yeah. if the private sector is doing very well, it should pay back a lot uh, to the development bank rather than just pay back the loan at the normal interest rate. And that, that money, that profit can then be used to cross-subsidize if you have some area where you want to put renewable energy and it's not particularly efficient because there isn't that much wind or something. You, you can afford to do that. And, and these, these, and also in, in certain sectors where you want to kickstart investment, say in poorer areas or crucial areas for, for the environment, you can combine it with some government subsidies as long as it's transparent, time limited, and so on. You know, so that you have more flexibility in the, in the use of instruments than if you are just commercial bank just focusing on your three months profits. Can I just make one final point on that? I think some of the work that we're doing around public procurement is, in, is interesting as well. So how you, how you do link public procurement to investment decisions through the NIB and elsewhere too. 
Uh, mm. And it's something I don't think that we've effectively done for a number of years. When, when I was a kid on the, the GRC, we used, um, I was chair of finance then, and we had our own capital fund. And I had, uh, well, it was, it was Nirvana, really. I could control the business and the rates as well as the local council rates, etc. And we were able to use procurement on the GRC, particular capital procurement, to try and raise um, levels of investment in certain geographical areas, but also conditions, so use of local employment and that sort of thing. Now, again, what we, need, we are now exploring a lot more the use of public procurement more effectively at every, re, every level of government, so that we actually then getting... Um, first of all, we're getting more effective local spend and regional spend, but also um, in the face of what's happening with regard to Carillion and Interserve and the various privatisations uh, that have taken place, that we get actually more stable and uh, more stable and more efficient uh, procurement expenditures too. Okay. Right, we are running out of time, but I think we may just take two more questions. Uh -huh. There's a hand here. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. Uh, just wondering um, to what extent profit making can guarantee uh, efficiency. Can you talk louder? Sorry? Louder. Oh, yeah, sure. Um, I was wondering to what extent profit making can uh, guarantee efficiency. Mm -hmm. And also, um, to what extent NIBs could tackle or address the most structural economic issues that austerity failed to address. The reason I'm asking this question is uh, thinking about France, and uh, the BPI has done a good job and quite, um, yeah, just good job, but it's far from addressing the most structural economic issues that France that France is um, facing currently. So is is the job of NIB to rebalance the economy, and if so, I haven't seen any case to support that. Hello, um, my name's Eddie Prevost, I'm a retired docker. And what I'm concerned about is I'm, I'm actually sold on the idea of rebalancing the economy and uh, this investment bank. It seems to make absolute common sense to anybody. The problem, it seems to me, is you're going to face a barrage of criticism for the Tory press, probably the banking industry, the World Bank is probably going to be uh, have a, a Trumpite in, in as well, and so it's going to be very difficult. It seems to me that you have to present the argument to the electorate. I can see this as being a winner in the, in the coming election, and if presented in the right way. And what I mean by that, if, if you look at, say, the nuclear argument that was presented about Trident, um, it, it was... It had no. Uh, it was opposed by the trade unions basically because they felt their members would lose jobs. But if a Labour government had said to them, "We're going to switch the sort of jobs to the jobs that the green jobs that are there to be had," then maybe you could persuade them to give up trying. Because for me, nuclear power is just a reason to to, to fuel our weapon system. If we haven't got, you know, if we haven't got that. But when you look at our, any potential opponent, you know, the size of our country seems to me ridiculous to have a weapon system. Right, okay. We need to concentrate on economic policy. Right, good. Okay. So. Agreed. <laughs> In terms of the barrage of criticism, it's interesting. The Tory press will, will always have a pop. And, but it's interesting because actually... Uh, within, uh, within the finance sector itself, where you'd expect a, a scale of resistance, I don't think there is. I think there's a... When we published the report from Graham Turner on the analysis of the finance sector, it, it was taken seriously, and we've got Graham touring around now, meeting various groups, and as I am as well. So people are beginning to take seriously the ideas we've put forward, because they also, um, large sections of them also see the weaknesses in our current economy and how it should be addressed. And all of them say the same thing, whether they're pension fund managers, asset managers, or straightforward bankers or whatever, all of them see the failure of government in terms of investment in the infrastructure 
and there's a welcoming, as the point that Stephanie made, there's a welcoming of a process by which we can complement the mm. private sector. And if you look at what, just examples in Canada and elsewhere, the mm. way pension funds have been used there, we're using that as a, a model of how we can draw in the different elements of what are the private sector to enable us to work alongside this. So we haven't had that sort of resistance in that sense. But there will be criticisms. That's the point that, that the, the, the gentleman made, really. We've got to make sure that when we develop these policies, we, we communicate them in a way in which people fully understand. And that's why when we're doing these meetings at the local level, people do understand because they then come up with their individual projects that they think could transform their local economies and how they can use the investment within their particular area that they haven't seen for at least the last eight years, if not longer, to how they can use that then to start transforming their own economies and, and in, improving their overall livelihoods. So there's a, I agree with you, there's a, there's a communication um, campaign that we've got to continue to wage on all of this. But it is, it's interesting, it gets down to bread and butter issues as well. So when you go to an area that's threatened with um, fracking, for example, and you can say, well, here's the opportunity for funding of an alt alternative energy sources within your region, it's quite remarkable how the debate opens up and people see that there are alternatives to what's being offered by the market at, at the moment. Um, the question about can profit make and guarantee efficiency, no, not necessarily. There's other aspects about how you define efficiency, about if you are, if you are, as Joshua said, we're developing an industrial strategy that's mission-oriented, so it is whether or not you achieve those ob objectives overall. And part of the, the, the mission that we want isn't just about tackling climate change, it isn't just about innovation, but it's making sure the prosperity that comes from those investments is shared by everybody, and that people actually then see... Uh, 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 an improvement in, the, in their lives, the quality of their lives. So all of that will be some of the um, issues that we need to address in the development of economic strategy overall. Um, I'll allow St Stephanie to comment on the, the French experience on the structural change. Yeah, I mean, uh, one, one thing I was thinking when John was speaking is whether it wouldn't be interesting, even though they are foreigners, and they're not very popular now in, in this country, um, to bring people from KFW and yeah, maybe, maybe French BPI yeah. and to tell the, the story of how, uh, you know, what they do, how they work closely with the private sector, mm -hmm. to show that this is mainstream and that it's normal in other countries. And that we are a sort of outlier, as John said, an anomaly. Um, I think, um, I think the BPI, French BPI is, is relatively small, it's been growing, um, and it, it's doing some interesting things like digitalizing SMEs, um, going into new innovation sector, creating venture capital, also development of the capital markets. Um, but I think it, it hasn't had enough time and enough scale to make these very necessary changes. Actually, France has a lower proportion of GDP in, in the industrial sector than the UK which is like amazing. So it, it, it is actually a very big task to, to, to rebuild that. Yeah. Thanks, Stephanie. Uh, we have run out of time. So uh, we've had a fascinating debate, some great contributions, great questions. I'd like you to join me in thanking our speakers. Before you race off to the drinks and snacks, well, firstly, there are some drinks and snacks at the back, so please do stay and join us and, and talk to us. Uh, Stephanie's book is available at a discount, uh, and she will sign it for you there at the back. Also, we all have pamphlets available for you to take away. Uh, I'd like to tell you that, uh, that PEF has two more lectures coming up, so dates for your diary. Uh, Danny Dawling is giving a lecture at LSE. Uh, on the 29th of March, which happens to be Brexit Day. Uh, and who knows what's going to happen on that day, and Danny is going to be talking, come what may. And then after that, uh, date to be fixed, we're having a lecture with Simon Ren Lewis, who will be talking to his book about the media and how uh, macroeconomics is misrepresented. And so if you need, uh, if you, I'd like you to sign up on our sheets. If you're not on our mailing list, please sign the sheets at the uh, back of the room. 
So uh, thank you very, very much for coming, and we look forward to seeing you at the next lecture. And the reception. We didn't say the reception. We did earlier on. You've got to stay for a picture.